see in the second half of the chapter is where we really see what's going on. Where we really see our salvation. Not that you don't in the beginning. But you know, we came through four chapters, and the fourth chapter talks about Abraham being justified by faith. And then when we get to the beginning of chapter 5, it continues that thought. But verse 12 really should show us who we are in Jesus Christ, what he has done. So let's start in looking into the Word of God today. We're going to start with verse 1. Now as I went through, I couldn't help but go to uh, Strong's exhaustive concordance. Go to the concordance and look up some of the words because I like King James Version, but it's a translation. There's just some things you can't translate. I know sometimes when we're sitting in Bible study, Mr. Miguel Sr. will say, what is that in English? This is Spanish. And sometimes it's not an English word. Um, when Disney World put, put, a, put a Disney in Japan and they had the Pirates of the Caribbean, they, the, when you ride through the ride in the Pirates of the Caribbean, it says, uh, dead men tell no tales. And there was no Japanese equivalent. All they could say was something that kind of translated to, if you're not careful, you might not pass this way again. They said there is no equivalent. And sometimes there's just not an equivalent for the Hebrew or for the Greek. And so men will do their best, but sometimes it's not perfect. And if you get an original King James Bible, there's over 2,000 alternate translations because they said, you know, it's difficult. It could be this, it could be that. So we're going to kind of look at some of it because sometimes I think it's a little bit misleading. A few times on here I actually used the NLT because I thought, this is not really clear, but the NLT was. So I think we have to reach out to all the tools we can to try to understand what the Lord is really saying. Um, I'm not a Hebrew or a Greek scholar. I have studied it somewhat, but people who have really studied it and can read the Bible in the original language, uh, one pastor told me, he said, I don't do Hebrew and Greek, but my son does. And he said, I asked him, what's the difference in just reading a translation and reading the original? He said, Dad, it's like black and white TV and color TV. You're reading the translation, it's like a black and white TV. But when you see it in the original language, it's full of color. So, you know, we, we have to kind of do a little bit of homework. We don't have that, so we look up the meanings and maybe use, look at a different, couple of different versions just to see. I know in the one commentary I was reading, the guy said, King James is great here, but on this one, the revised version is better uh, because it's clearer on the thought. But I hope we can bring out the thought a little bit more clearly so we see what's going on. Let's start at verse 1. Therefore, so after all this talk about Abraham being justified by faith, he's saying, so therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that word peace, what do you think of when you think of peace? Oh, my mind is clear, nothing's troubling me. That's not the peace it's talking about. The peace is talking about is a kind of peace between two warring factions. The war is over and we now have peace. So what it's saying is, and I, and I put it here, it's, it's, it's number 1515. Peace by implication, prosperity, is rest plus set at one again. Do we realize we were enemies of God? Of true warfare, we were enemies of God, hateful and hating one another, enemies in our mind by wicked works. We were in rebellion and in warfare with God. Not he in warfare with us, although we had treasured up wrath. We were at enmity with God. And we need to see that. I wasn't just, I needed some tweaking. No, I was an enemy of God. I, I want us to get this clear. You weren't just kind of bad. I was raised in a Christian home and I was pretty good, and, but I did a couple of bad things. No, you didn't do a couple of bad things. You were the enemy of God, and we need to come to see that. And his cross has justified us by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And, you, and, and people try to say, you know, morality without Jesus. There's no such thing as being at peace without Jesus. There's only one way to be justified, and that's faith in Jesus Christ. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that, that word is number 1223, and I'm going to put a little asterisk every time it's used, up until verse 11. After that, I didn't do it. But I want to show you how many times that literally means this is the channel of an act. This is the channel, and the channel is always through Jesus Christ, always through his blood. There is no other channel, there is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
And people argue this. I've had people leave this church over it. I cannot accept that you say it's through Jesus only. I have friends who are Buddhist and Muslim and all. They no, it's not my words. There's only one God. His name is Jesus. And he is the only way. Jesus said if you come up any other way, you're a thief and a robber. He is the only channel. You cannot get to the Father except through Jesus. It's not arguable. People try to argue it. It doesn't matter what you argue. God himself said there's only one way, and it's through Jesus Christ. It's not open for discussion. It's not open for a vote. God is not a democracy. He's a monarch. He's the king. He says what it is, and it is, period. There's no argument. So let's look at verse 2. By, it starts off with that same word, the channel through, by whom, that is through Jesus, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Now that into says, it actually translates abundant and far more exceeding. Far more exceeding. We have access by faith far more exceeding, far more abundant into the grace wherein we stand. We stand only in grace. If you're standing on any of your works, any of them, well, I know it's grace, and then I didn't, no. God did his part, and I, no. Not, not God did his part, and I do my part, and I added to it. You have no part. It's all through Jesus. Access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. If you're not standing in grace, you're not standing. You're actually falling. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. What is hope? Hope is desire with expectation to receive. When people say, oh, I hope so. That, I say, you're not hoping. That, that's just a woeful unbelief. You're going to be, you're saved. You're going to heaven. I hope so. God's going to take care of your loved ones. Oh, I hope so. Jesus Christ makes you healed, makes you well. Oh, I hope so. That's, see, just your tone of voice always tells me that's not hope. Hope is desire with expectation to receive. I have a hope of glory. I know I'm going to see the glory of God. Amen. I know I'm going to be in His glorified presence. I'm going to share in His glory. Uh, it's, not, it's not debatable. It's not a doubt. Jesus said it. And He finished the work. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. How many of us rejoice? Yes. How many of our day? Seriously, let's think about it. How much rejoicing do we do as compared to how much murmuring and moaning and, and sometimes murmur is inaudible murmur is not a word a complaint is a word murmur is oh, yeah I have to go to work yeah things like you know we might not even say it oh, uh, like you already know like life is hard Where I don't hear any rejoicing where's I'm going through a trial well guess what there's a lot of trials but we can still rejoice in the hope of the glory of God Amen. how many of us praise and rejoice that's what should be coming out of our mouths because the Spirit of God is in us and the Spirit of God is never complaining or discouraged. And, and it's not that we don't get discouraged. That's right. Anybody who says they never get discouraged, I don't think they're telling the truth because mm -hmm. I think we all go through periods. Paul did, David did, Moses did, Elijah did. And that's where the body of Christ is important too because we need to associate with the body of Christ, fellowship with the body of Christ because when one <laughs> member suffers, we all suffer with them. We, we should uphold each other, pray for each other, encourage each other. But you ever get around people who are always complaining in darkness? Like you walk in the room. When they walk in, it's like the lights went off in the room. <laughs> and the first thing they do is come in and, oh, life. how are you today? Oh, my soul man is. I thought, no, not some man. Not my soul man is. My being good. I said, <laughs> very well in the Lord. You can always say I'm fine in the name, name of Jesus. When I was in Nigeria, uh, uh, there's several languages, four basic languages. And, and I learned a little bit, little bit of Ibu, but they would say, Kedu, and that means how are you? And you say, Odama means I'm fine. But we'd always add Nime Chuku. Chuku is Jesus, fine in the name of the Lord. Because, you know what, I might be going through a trial, but I'm still fine in the name of the Lord. Yes. I remember when I was sick for eight years when I was in my 20s and people come out and say, how are you? I'm just barely able to go. I'm fine in the Lord. Amen. Really? Or are you just saying that by faith? Well, really? I'm in the Lord? I am fine. I'm fine in, in Jesus Christ. I'm always fine in Jesus Christ. Winds and waves change, but Jesus never fails. That song just now, he's always there. He always has us in his hands. He never fails. And, and if I said, can you say any different? I, I don't even want to hear it because you can't say any different. 
He has never failed. He has never failed. It's far more exceeding, it's far more abundant. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, verse 3, and not only so, not just that, but we glory in tribulations also. I don't just glory in, uh, rejoice in the glory of God. I glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience works experience, and experience brings hope. Why? Because all that I've ever been through, it was just another experience to teach me that God is always faithful. Every time something looked impossible, God always proved to be more than sufficient. He always was more than a conqueror. Times when it looked so dark, when it looked like there was no way out, the Lord has always been faithful. Amen. And He's always Amen. made a roadway in the wilderness. And experience hope, and hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And there's that word again. The channel is through the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The love of God is now in our hearts. You know what that love does? Perfect <coughs> love casts out all fear. And the only perfect love is the love of God. And His love coming in casts out all fear. Because now I know I'm a child of God. An heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. And if God be for me, who can be against me? So the fear is gone because the love is here. When You know what? When people fear, it's like sometimes people say, um, I th is somebody trying to take my job? Are they trying to push me out and they're always afraid? Well, you shouldn't be worried. I, I need job security. My security is not in my job. Amen. My security is in Jesus Christ. See, when we have, know that God loves us, they, we don't fear anything. I don't fear somebody taking my job. I don't fear somebody uh, robbing me or anything because regardless of the circumstances, God will always take care of me. It's His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It's not my bank account. So, so what, if, what if somebody steals from you? The Lord's still there. He has never forsaken us and never will. So verse 6 now says, For when we were yet without strength, and that's all of us, we had no strength to serve God. We had no way to approach God. We were without strength. In due time, Christ died for who? The ungodly. And we think, oh yeah, those people. No, not those people. That's us. He died for the ungodly. We were all ungodly. Un means not. We were not godly. We didn't have God. We were without God. Paul had to say that to the Gentiles at one time. He said, I want to remind you of one thing. I want you guys to remember, because he was the apostle of the Gentiles. I want you to remember that there was a time when you were called Gentile dogs. You were called the uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision. You were strangers from the covenant of promise, aliens to the commonwealth of Israel, having no hope and without God in this world. But now you who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus. That's the only way. You had no hope, and now it's the blood of Jesus that's drawn us nigh. So we were without strength, but Christ died for us who were ungodly, which is everybody. He died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die... Yet peradventure for a good man, sometimes people see somebody that's really good, maybe they would die for a really, really good person. Not usually, though. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yes. Not when we were good. We never were good. He died for us when we were his enemies, when we were sinners, when we were rebelling against him. We don't want you. We hate you. And people say, I never hated God. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. If you didn't have love, you had hate. An enemy is a hater. We were all haters. If we're not surrendering to him, then we're a hater. The Bible clearly says that we were enemies. And we hated God. And he died for us when we were in that condition. Christ died for us. Now, since he did that, if he died for you and if he died for me while I was an enemy, imagine going out on a battlefield and, and this other side just killed your best friend. They just shot your friends and all. And you go out there and somebody's got to die and you say, I'm going to die for you. Die for your enemy. Who does that? Say, maybe I would die for my friend. I'm definitely not dying for my enemy. But he died for us. And if he did that much more than 
now that we're justified by his blood, what does justified mean? It means justified, never sinned. There is no record against you. I think sometimes Christians keep dragging over into our relationship with the Lord. Yeah, you know, uh, everything's written down against me. No, it's not. He said your sin, sins and lawless acts, I will remember no more. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. There is the record that I have is my name is in the Lamb's book of life. Now, if you reject Jesus, you still have the book of the deeds of the body. That's still against you. Why is it not against me? Because he took it. He took it upon himself and bore all the wrath of God. Now, so I'm justified much more now that I'm justified by his blood. See, without shedding of blood, there's no remission. The blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer could never sanctify to the purifying of the conscience, but there was a continual remembrance of sin in those offerings, the book of Hebrews says. Every time you came to offer, it was a remembrance of sin. But this man, when he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, and he said, Your sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more sacrifice for sins. There's no more sacrifice. There's no more coming to the Day of Atonement. There's no more remembrance. Your sins have been taken away, propitiated. Praise God. So, if he died when we were enemies, much more than now that we are bought with the price, now that we're justified, we shall be saved from wrath through him. He's the channel through Jesus Christ. We're saved from wrath. There is no wrath left for me because he took it all. The wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. The anger for sin was poured out on Jesus Christ. Now, if he bore it and I bear it, then, that, then there's double jeopardy. He didn't bear it, so I'd bear it. He didn't bear sin, so I would bear sin. He didn't bear wrath, so I would turn around and bear it again. And with his stripes, I'm healed. He didn't intend for me to bear it either. If he took it, why am I taking it? The devil dupes us into a lot of stuff. Hey, I call him the bully boy. He bullies us, and bullies are always cowards who try to convince you that they're stronger than you, that they have something on you. And he tries to rob us. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Christ has come to give us life and life more abundantly. Since he can't touch you, he messes with you and tries to make you think, you're unworthy. Remember what you did. You should be sick because of the way you are. You should just bear with it because you deserve to be sick. You deserve to be robbed. And we fall for the lies of the devil instead of seeing what Jesus Christ was a permanent offering he did it all and my standing is in Jesus not in me Amen. so we're spared saved from the wrath to come through him now verse 10 is beautiful well it all is but this is a verse I quote often and this is something we need to understand as God's children for if or let's say since it's not if because it's since since when we were enemies. Anybody in here was an enemy of God? Raise your hand if you were an enemy. If you don't raise your hand, you're wrong. Or you're just lazy. <laughs> won't raise your hand. <laughs> if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. That was a channel. We were reconciled by the death of His Son. Much more now that we are reconciled, that is bought back, we shall be saved by His life. Because people say... I don't agree with this teaching that Jesus took away the sins of the whole world because if he took away all the sins, then the whole world's saved because the taking away of sins is salvation. No, it's not. Taking away sins does not save you. It saves me from the wrath, yeah, but you're not saved because eternal life, you don't have life. You're spiritually dead. Clearing the deck of what's separating you from God doesn't save you. You're still dead. You're a forgiven corpse. The life of Christ saves you. That's why Paul said the mystery of the gospel hid from the ages. They had sacrifices back then, blood offerings. But they never had life. Life comes only through Jesus Christ. Amen. If when we were enemies we were reconciled by the death of his son, much more now that we're reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Paul said the mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, your only hope of glory. So now we have Christ in us. Who can have Christ in them? The whole world. I can't. You don't know what I've done. You don't know how sinful I am. The Lord already took away your sins. 
He doesn't have anything against me? No. You're spiritually dead. That's against you. You can receive Jesus and live right now. Wow, that sounds like it's too good to be true. I've heard people say, that's too good to be true. It is too good, but it is true. It is too good, but it's true. There's nothing stopping you from receiving Jesus. I've had so many people. My wife's grandfather said, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I know there's too much in my life. He was a rough character. He was a roofer, foul mouth. I, I didn't know him, but I heard a lot of stories about him. He went to churches. They had the steps out there. He pulled the steps away, threw a smoke bomb in, and then laughed when people came out and fell out the door when steps were gone. Just a rascal. Wonderful guy once he got saved. You know when he got saved? When he was 74 years old. When he was 74. He might say, I'm not going to change, and I'm not going to accept the Lord and be a hypocrite until I change my ways. Well, he found out after years and years that wasn't happening. People say, I'm going to... Stop sinning first and then come. Well, you'll never come then because you are not stopping sinning just as I am. Come just as you are. In all your sin, come. the Lord didn't tell you to change and come. He asked you to come. Just come. Now, He'll transform you by the renewing of your mind once He convinces you you're a new creature, which is hard sometimes for us to get a hold of. What I'm doing doesn't make sense. I used to enjoy this sin. It's horrible now. Like now when I do it, there's, there's no fun. It's like, why, is it, why do I feel different? Because you're a new creature. Butterflies don't crawl into dirt. Worms crawl into dirt. Now that you're a butterfly, you say, well, what am I crawling for? I can fly. Yes. I, I can fly above all this. So we're saved by his life. And then verse 11, and not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. I want to look at this. Received is actually accept plus be amazed. I accept him, I receive, and I'm amazed at how great it is. I had no idea that Jesus was this great. Receiving him, I'm in total amazement. I am astonished, I'm astounded, I am stunned. I am stunned at this salvation. Yes. How many people, I know even in our Bible studies on Monday night, sometimes we just sit there and we're stunned at the grace of God. Sometimes there's tears like, well, I've heard this over, I've been hearing this for years, but it still stuns me. It still amazes me. People sing amazing grace. Well, we should be amazed. Like this is just beyond human comprehension that an enemy can become a child. That I'm accepted when I know that there's nothing acceptable in me, but I'm acceptable to God and loved by God. That's amazing. And then the atonement here is not the Old Testament term atonement. That was a cover. Propitiation is to take it away. That's what Jesus did. They dragged the word atonement over. Atonement was always covering temporarily until next year, and then you cover again, you cover again. But the book of Hebrews says, the ashes of a heifer and the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. But Jesus did. So this word atonement is actually this Greek word, katalagae, and it means to exchange restoration to divine favor restoration to divine favor we've received accepted with amazement restoration to favor with God isn't that amazing that is mind-boggling for the human mind we can't comprehend it let's go on into the verse 12 now and start this with the two Adam thing I, I think this is important I put this picture on your bulletin this is from Clarence Larkin it's one of his charts it's amazing the parallels in Hebrew and Genesis. And that's why I say people need to study the book of Genesis because there's two gardens, there's two trees, and there's two Adams. Adam was in a beautiful garden where there was a beautiful tree, the first Adam. He was sinless at the time, created in the image of God, but only a man. He was commanded not to eat the fruit of that tree or he would surely die. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there was a tree and it was a dead tree, undesirable. That, the tree Adam partook of was beautiful and desirous to make one wise, but it didn't make you wise. It actually took it away. This tree, there's no beauty that you should desire it and you're commanded to eat of it. 
that tree we're commanded not to eat or you will die. This tree we're commanded to, to eat and we shall live. This is my body which is broken for you. Except you eat in my flesh, you have no part with me. We're commanded to eat of this tree that has no form nor comeliness and no beauty and we shall live. The tree that looks alive and well is the source of death. The tree that looks dead is actually the source of life. And in this garden, do eat of this tree. You cannot live except you eat from this tree. Without this cross, you cannot live. Praise God. And you look at that. This man, Adam, brought guilt. He brought shame. He brought condemnation and death. The second Adam, the last Adam, who is God from heaven, says no more guilt, no more condemnation, no more separation. And, and Adam brought separation. He was kicked out of the garden and, 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 a, and a cherubim were placed there, seraphim were placed there to guard the, guard the way. Now the way is open. There's no more separation. There's no more guilt. There is no condemnation. And there's life. Amen. Life. What a salvation. And who would think, like, how can salvation come this way? See, the human mind can't fathom the things of God. We say, I wouldn't have done it that way. Of course you wouldn't have, because none of us are smart enough to do it that way. And that's why we question God, and I hear people try to use logic. Well, logically, I think, wait a minute. There's nothing going to be logical between your brain and God's, because your brain is really small, and we only use like one-tenth of our potential. And God's brain is really big. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are His ways higher than ours, and His thoughts and our thoughts. So don't try to figure things out. Even when we pray about something. Well, logically, not, not logically, God's going to do something. It's going to be different than what you think. Amen. Name in the Syrian. Go dip in the muddy Jordan seven times because you got your flesh is rotten. In mud? In the dirty water? I'm going to dip in mud to be healed? This doesn't make sense. No. And so... He went away with his leprosy. And then his servant said, hey, my father. He called him father in respect. Mm -hmm. If the prophet told you to do some big, great thing, wouldn't you have done it? Yeah. How much more when he says, wash and be clean? Go do it. And he did it and he was healed. Just do what God said. He makes, God makes a lot of sense. We just don't understand it because we don't make sense. We don't. I'm serious. So two gardens, two trees, two atoms. And, and the reason we're saying this, because this whole second part of the chapter is going to be on this one subject. Okay, and we already mentioned about the first tree and the second tree. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says this. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Yes. He is the life giver. The first one was a living soul, and he died spiritually. The last one is a life-giving spirit, the only source of life. You will never be spiritually alive until Jesus comes in. So let's go on through these verses and see now, starting at verse 12. When Adam sin, sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Everybody has sinned. All his sin comes short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. There's none that doeth right. No, not one. Mm -hmm. So Adam's sin brought sin and death to the whole human race. Yes, people sinned even before the law was given. You say, well, wait a minute. Adam broke a commandment. God said, don't eat, and he did. But all the people after that, they, they never got a direct commandment from God. And the law didn't come until Moses which was hundreds of years later. There was no law, so... And that's what God says here. Yes, people sinned before, even before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Right. How can you say I broke a law when there's not a law? Cop pulls you over and says you were speeding. They say well, it wasn't a speed limit sign. So you can't get me for speeding because there's no speed limit. Mm -hmm. So if there's no limit, how do I get a ticket? You can't. And, and people understand that. But, nevertheless, still, everyone died from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not uh, disobey any explicit command of God, as Adam did. They still died because death had already entered the world. Yes. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ, who is yet to come. He's only a symbol. He's not the real deal. Mm -hmm. It's like the tabernacle 
back in the Levitical priesthood was not the real one. The real one's in heaven. See, when we go into the Holy of Holies, we're not going into the Holy of Holies made by hands, but into heaven itself. Before the throne crying, Daddy, Father. Who can do that? The high priest could only go once a year. I can go all day and night and call him Daddy, Father. Not, oh, uh, El Shaddai, Elohim, with proper language. I go, Daddy, I really need help. To God himself. And people, we, we, we kind of, I, I think we take it for granted. Like, if you could go down, I went to the White House last year, and I was hoping I would see the president, but he, he wasn't in there. And I just thought, imagine if you could go down there and say, uh, Chuck Kelly's here, he wants to see you. Okay, tell him to come in. To be like, who? No, he can't come in. It was hard enough just to get a tour of the White House. I don't know you, but I can go to the God of the universe, the King of Kings, I can go right in and he knows my name. You ever think about that? I could go anytime and he loves me and accepts me. That's mind-boggling to me. I don't know about anybody else, but I think it's mind-boggling. He's a symbol or a representation of Christ who was yet to come. But there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. I want us to get this because I think the Christian church in general is paralyzed. We're paralyzed. Because we, we think Adam and Jesus are pretty much equal. What he did to bring sin was devastating and it was universal. But Christ, we don't see his... We, is there anybody here that doubts what Adam was able to do? Does anybody here doubt that sin and death came into the world? There's a great difference. That's just a little cartoon of Adam on his face in shame and guilt and condemnation. This first Adam by one act of rebellion, and it was not just, oh, I was tempted to eat. It was rebellion. They knew that it meant we're under Christ's authority and that taking the tree of knowledge of good and evil means <coughs> you can be your own God. That's what the serpent told them. You can be your own God. You don't have to be under that guy. Get out from under his tyranny. You can be your own God knowing good and evil. Isn't that what he told him? And that sounded pretty good. Like, you know, I'm under God. I'd like to be my own God. That sounds good. You know, I could make my own choices. That was rebellion. Does anybody doubt that Adam's sin could bring down the whole human race in shame, guilt, and condemnation? I don't think anybody doubts it. Were you ever in shame and guilt and condemnation? Were you spiritually dead? Did you struggle? Were you frustrated? Right? Yes. Turmoil? Kill, feeling horrible, like no peace? I've been there, and I, I'm sure everybody has, or should be. I mean, I don't know how you're not. Do we doubt that he could plunge us all into depravity? Do things that we think now are disgusting. Things that... As Paul said, now you're ashamed to even talk of those things that you did. Like, what fruit had you then in those things whereof you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. They used to be enjoyable. Now you look back and you say, that was so depraved. Mm -hmm. That was so horrible. How did I not see it? How could my mind be that warped? But it is. We're in depravity. That we don't even know how bad it is. And that we all die because of it? Do we believe that Adam brought death? Well, you see everybody dying, right? I don't see anybody here like 800 years old, 1,000 years old. So obviously death did come in. That it could curse the whole creation. Not just humans, the whole creation's cursed. Thorns and all kinds of weather problems. and everything. The whole creation's cursed. The planets, everything. Paul says in Corinthians, the whole creation groaneth and travaileth, waiting to be clothed upon. It's the whole creation. One man's rebellion did all this, but nobody doubts that, right? No. Do you doubt that? No. What we do doubt is that we can be called perfect in God's eyes and that we are justified and that we are righteous in the eyes of God. That, I'm afraid, we doubt. And he's saying here, there's a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. There's a great difference. It's not equal to... That devastating choice that he made that brought the whole creation down, God's gift is nowhere near comparison to it. It is light years above that. So if that choice could bring us down like that, why do we doubt how full and how complete the finished work of Jesus on the cross is? Now let's look at that. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many, actually to all, but even greater, greater is God's wonderful grace 
and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. It's greater, not equal to. It's not just a remedy to make you better. It makes you perfect. By one offering, he's perfected forever those that are sanctified, those that are set apart for God. When you accepted Christ, you're set apart, and God says you're perfect. Now, in Genesis 3.15, God declared war. After this sin took place, he said, I am going to put enmity between the seed of the woman, which was virgin birth, because a woman doesn't have seed, a man has seed. So this is a prophecy. It's the first prophecy in the entire Bible, and it's a prophecy of the virgin birth of the Messiah. I'm going to put enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. It shall bruise thy heel, but you shall bruise his head. That means her, her child is going to rise up, Satan, and crush you, destroy you. This is a war. And it ended at the cross when Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. And I really believe, you know how we showed in the chronological Bible from the creation of Adam, which they proved it was on the sixth day, 39, April 1st, 3975 B.C. So Jesus started his public ministry at the age of 30. And 29 A.D., or yeah, 29 A.D. on April the 1st, 4,000 years to the day from the first Adam to the second Adam. I was looking at the chronological Bible and I couldn't get the details, but I really believe it was 4,000 years to the day from the declaration of war to the end of the war. That the Lord crushed the head of the serpent. Here's just a picture. I love this. His heel was bruised on the cross, but he completely destroyed the works of the devil. The devil has no authority over you. He has no power over you. He only lies to you. And when we believe his lies, we hold ourselves in captivity because the Lord has set us free. Sin and death has no dominion over us. Reckon yourselves also to be, and we'll see in the next chapter, be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto Christ, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Reckon yourself. That is, believe it because it's true. You're dead to sin. Reckon it. Believe that you're free. Oh, I believe Adam put me in sin. I believe I'm in sin, but I'll believe that. But I won't believe much greater is God's free gift of grace. Much greater. I don't believe that can set me free because you don't know me. I've been struggling with this. I've been struggling with this so many years. I, I'm still in bond. Like, you're still in bondage, really? Okay, because that's your perspective. That's not God's perspective. You don't realize what Jesus Christ has done. And then I like this. You saw Adam on his face. This is the conquering hero. This is the king of kings and lord of lords. The second Adam is God by one man's obedience. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He laid down his life of his own accord for us. But why does anybody doubt that Jesus' righteousness can recover the whole human race? That it can justify, make righteous, deliver from guilt, shame, condemnation, give life. We are redeemed from the curse. I'm telling you, we do doubt that. So, how, how's things going in your life with Jesus? Well, I'm not what I should be. I thank God, I'm, but I'm, I'm not what I used to be. So it's been a little improvement. Oh, please. What are you looking at? Your own works? Yeah. Because it really hasn't been an improvement. You just did better one day. You still like, you still, your flesh is still the flesh. I'm not what I should be. I'm exactly what I should be. I'm in Christ. Amen. And his great gift, Adam brought me down, but Jesus got and put me back up. Amen. I am redeemed through the blood of Jesus on the cross. Amen. Redeemed means bought back. But we go redeem coupons all the time. Yeah. This little piece of paper says it's worth $3. Scan, $3 just came off my bill. How about that? It's redeemed. Well, guess what? We've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. When you scan the coupon and put it in, it doesn't pop back up. Oh, let me check my receipt. On. No, it took the $3 off. It's redeemed. Amen. Well, I'm redeemed. Guess what? I've already been bought back and put through the slot. Amen. I'm eternally secure through Jesus Christ. He already dropped me in. He said, you are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. Yes. Seated there already. My standing is perfect before God. Why can't we believe Jesus can do that? He has done it. Now, verse 16. And the result, here's the result. The result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. Very different? It's not just like barely making it? No. 
For Adam's sin led to condemnation, right? Condemnation means you're doomed for eternal destruction. But God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, that is justification, even though we are guilty of many sins. You say, but, but I have so many sins. He already knows that. That's why he took them on himself at the cross. I told this story before. I, would, I, I hate to keep saying the same story. It sounds like I'm old and getting seen now, but I'm not. I just, somebody might have missed it. I hope I'm not anyway. So, no, I have a <laughs> I, when we had high school up at the old place and I was down at the gym and I, I, there was a lot of drugs going on down there and this kingpin of the drug guys I mean he was always lifting weights he's a big guy everybody was afraid of him so we're going back up to the high school and he said hey are you Chuck and I said yeah he said can I talk to you and I came over and sat to the picnic table I told all the kids I said go on back it's just a block away I said walk back to the high school I was going to kill myself last night he said I pulled my car in the garage and put the garden hose in the exhaust pipe, and I shut the door. And he said, I can't stand my life. He said, my mom's a saint, and I treat her like, he said, S-H-I-T. Mm -hmm. He said, I just, my life, I, I just want to end it. Mm -hmm. And I said, God loves you. And Jesus took away your sins at the cross of Calvary. He took away the sins of the whole world, and he said, you don't know what I do on the streets to make money. And I did know. Mm -hmm. The fights and the probably killings and everything else. Mm -hmm. And I said, but God was in Christ reconciling the world himself, not counting their sins against him anymore. What you don't have is life. You're spiritually dead, and the works you do are because you're spiritually dead. But the Lord has taken away your sins at the cross of Calvary if you'll have his life. And he sat there and couldn't believe it. He loves me. And he followed me to the school and got a Bible. See, that's what people think. Even though, like, we can't believe that the sins are gone. Even though we are guilty of many sins, he's justified us. My list of sins, if they were in the book, I mean, they'd have to write so many books. But they're all taken away at the cross. And I'm righteous through Jesus Christ. For the sin of this one man, Adam, calls death to rule over many. But even greater, even greater than that, much greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live and triumph over sin and death. King James says reign in life. Kings reign. We reign in life. Through this one man, Jesus Christ, it's through Jesus Christ. Do we believe that? Or do we still keep going around woeful and, oh, my sin, my sin, instead of seeing I'm reigning in life through Jesus Christ. He knows my sins are many. He took them away and he justified me. His gift is so much greater. I got that through Adam. What I get through Jesus is much greater. Wonderful grace. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, that is Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. There is no sin. Just the same as, as if you never sinned. If God could show your life and say, you go back and you start over and you never sinned, you'd feel pretty good then, wouldn't you? Well, you can feel good like that because he said justified, never sinned. Justification means zero record. It's totally gone. Acquitted, exonerated, whatever term you want to use, they are not there anymore. There is no sin recorded against you in Jesus Christ. I don't know about that. That's a little bit hard to accept. Well, then that's why you have struggles, because it's hard to accept, because you'll believe what Adam did, but the second Adam's gift is so much higher, but we won't believe that. It's too good to be true. No, it's too true and it's too good. It is true. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. But I'm not righteous. It's not you. You were made righteous. Made means the Creator made you righteous. If any man be Christ, he's a new creation. You've been made righteous. I don't see it. Well, your eyes don't see the spiritual. That's why. Ask God to open up the eyes of your understanding to see what God sees. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That's why it came, just so we'd see how sinful sin is. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Wow. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Read that verse with me. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Wow. This is what Jesus has done. Let's rest in it. Let's believe it. Let's rest in it. It is ours through Jesus Christ. May God open up our eyes to see this and bless it. Jesus.